this year's foraging slot is all about sorrel. Somewhere between dock and rhubarb, this is an overlooked treasure. Most people see it as a weed, but in fact, every part of the plant is useful for something. Sorrel is useful across several seasons too, particularly spring and summer. In spring, the young leaves are glossy and succulent and great for adding to salads and just grazing on as you find them, as long as you know that the place you're picking them from is clean. The leaves are really lemony, even when they're young. By summer, the plant is throwing out really big leaves and seed heads and they start to turn a beautiful red that's going to be useful for us later. Sorrel soup is great to make from these larger leaves and the more you cook them, the more they'll lose that sharp flavour, which is helpful as the season goes on because they become super sharp. By autumn, the plants have got really tough and have gone to seed. I don't yet know a use for the seed, but I'm sure there will be one. That's because I know that an excavation at Howenstromness, which turned up what was probably an Iron Age medicine chest, also found charred sorrel seed. Today I'll be using the leaves, stalks and roots of sorrel for different things. So I'll start by separating off the leaves and the stems and the roots and cleaning them up a bit. I'll be bringing in a few other foraged ingredients too, including Chondrus crispus, a seaweed that you can find on the low shore and which is harvested to make carrageenan. Auroch and nettles, very common shore plants, especially in July when we're filming. Rhubarb, rose petals to make a chinny rose jam from Rosa rugosa petals which are also abundant right now. And finally some sheep fleece which I foraged from a handy fence this week. Now I've got the fire lit, I'm just going to show you what we'll be cooking on it and the kinds of equipment I'll be using. This is my cast iron mini cauldron, which I'll be using as a dye bath to get some colour from the leaves of sorrel. I'm just using seawater with the leaves and there's a reason for that. If I can get colour for dyeing fleece, I'll also save some of it as an ink and I've found that fresh inks made by boiling and steeping last a bit longer with salt in because they can go a bit frousty, especially if you keep them indoors and not in the fridge. Now that the dye bath is coming to the boil, I'll get on making some lunch. I'm going to make tortillas from sorrel, nettle leaves and auroch and cook them to have with some flatbreads and some quick chilli jam, which I'll be making with rhubarb and sugar and rose petals. These are really simple recipes and I'll send you them if you get in touch at the end of the workshop. I'm a photographer. I enjoy using the camera and photography to explore the world around me and in particular the area of the shore and in particular to that seaweed. Seaweed's a subject that I found fascinating for over a decade now. I really enjoy going out to find the seaweed to make work about or to look around the space of the shore. Bursi's a great place, you've got a really wide range of seaweeds to select from. I like being in the sea and the feel of the seaweed in my hands. I find the size of some of the seaweeds, some of the bigger algae, astonishing. And the whole kind of structural element of them is something that, that really interests me. The shore is a really special place to work, I think. It's a sort of magical spot. It's neither fully land and it's neither fully sea. I've been really influenced by the work of Anna Atkins. She's one of the early pioneers of photography and she made cyanotypes. In fact, women and seaweed were inextricably linked when Anna Atkins produced the first photographically illustrated book in 1843. You feel like these seaweeds are trapped, trapped in the sea forever. I was fortunate enough to be living next door to Willie Thompson. 
I'd become really interested in seaweed and in its seaweed use on the land and as uh, fodder for animals. But perhaps seaweed is best known in terms of its history to Orkney in relation to the kelp industry and Willie Thompson's the man to turn to for information about that. Today I'm going to look at some of the kelp, some of the bigger brown seaweeds. These grow in very deep water and they can sometimes be seen at low tide. This one is called sugar kelp and in Orkney its name is skirter. In Japan it's used as a form of kombu. This one here in Japan well, it's very similar to a Japanese one called wakami, but this is Alaria esculenta. Now, that Latin name means winged tasty, and its ordinary name is honeyware, and that indicates that it is a, a seaweed of food value. It's also known as Merkel in Orkney. And at the base of this seaweed, you find these lovely sporophylls, and these are what grow into new blades, into new seaweeds and they're what the Latin name wing tasty refers to and in Orkney these particular bits have special names called mercules. Today we're going to look at two different types of tango. This one here is simply known by the single word tango, that's Laminaria digitata. Beautiful seaweed, lovely glossy blades it has. The other tangle, known in Orkney as Kuvi, is Laminaria hyperborea. And this seaweed is very similar to the tangle, but you will notice its stipe is really rough, and that allows other seaweeds to attach to it. Particularly dulse. Dulse is a fantastic seaweed. If you find some nice glossy dulse like this, you can take it home and dry it. And these stipes are very different in that the, the one of the tangle is very smooth indeed. And if you cut into these, you would find that the kuvi is actually round, its stipe is round, and that the tangle has an oval-shaped stipe. Now these seaweeds were once thought to be the same seaweed, and it was actually Reverend Clouston who was the first president of the Stromness Museum here in Orkney. He was a man who distinguished between these two seaweeds and for a while one of them actually bore its name. The Laminaria hyperborea as we now know it was once known as Laminaria clustoni, a lovely connection between Orkney and seaweed. The process I particularly enjoy using when I'm making work about seaweeds is a Victorian technique called photograms. Now photograms are very similar to what we looked at with Anna Atkins work with the cyanotypes because again you're laying the subject down onto a light sensitive bit of paper exposing it to the light in this case in the dark room and the seaweed almost acts like a mask leaving this reverse shadow behind it and you get this wonderful detail from the seaweeds and it's quite unpredictable you don't know quite how it's how it's going to turn out. But the Victorians loved this technique because they felt that the subject was making its own image. It was like a pencil of nature. I really like the starkness of the black and white that you get in photograms. And of course each one's unique because it's the actual object placed down on the paper. So each one is a one-off. As well as making artwork about seaweeds, I really enjoy collecting it to eat and I make sure that I harvest it sustainably and in order to do that I leave a fair amount of the seaweed behind and it can regrow. There's so much seaweed you, you just want to choose the best looking pieces. In this case this is some tango which I cut up and then I let it dry. It can dry outside but it does tend to reabsorb any moisture in the air. I use a dehydrator at home. And you can dry a wide variety of uh, seaweeds. And it's quite nice because I get them from different places in Orkney and then I feel when I'm cooking with them, I'm almost evoking that place. I'll use these in stocks. In all soup, I'll use these. 
Another way I like photographing seaweed is to really make use of that sculptural quality that they have and finding dried stipes on the shore. And these dried stipes kind of are contorted into all these very interesting shapes. And if you work on a very bright sunny day, you can really use these shadows to almost create what you would do in the dark room with a, with a photogram. But the sun becomes an active partner in this as well, throwing shadows at different angles. And I just use my phone to photograph these. It's something very easy to do, you can do it on the move. The holdfast is how the seaweed attaches itself to a rock in the sea, it's how it remains where it wants to be. And they can be remarkable structures. This is a couvey holdfast and it almost looks like a heart or a skull. Another way of making art using seaweed is to make some pressed seaweed specimens. And this is another Victorian pursuit. Seaweed collecting and making specimens was seen as a very genteel thing to do and lots of Victorian women were engaged in it. It kind of gave them a certain freedom to be thrashing about on the shore and in and out of the water. Maybe a freedom that they didn't experience elsewhere in their lives at that time. So I like to think that there's a sort of, a sort of rebellion in press seaweeds. In Stromus Museum, at least two of the collections of pressed seaweeds are made by women. So in many ways I feel through Anna Atkins and her first book of seaweed photography and through the pressed seaweeds that we see in the Victorian collections, through to me making work on the shore, I like to think that seaweed and women have always been linked. The rocky shores around our coasts are exciting places to explore and to forage. One note of caution, rocky shores are inherently slippery, weather conditions can change quickly and the sea must always be treated with great respect. When visiting the lower shore, please do not go alone and ensure that you are aware of tide times. On rocky shores of the Northeast Atlantic, the more conspicuous members of the biological community are racks, or rockweed, barnacles, and limpets. These organisms frequently dominate the midshore dependent on wave activity. Sheltered shores tend to be associated with greater abundance of racks, and exposed conditions feature well-defined zones of abundant barnacles. On more moderately exposed shores, the key organisms form a patchy mosaic prone to cyclical changes. Depending upon the stage in the cycle, racks tend to form canopy-providing clumps which favour aggregation of limpids, but at the same time limiting barnacle settlement by sweeping action of the fronds. With time and wave action, the clumps of racks thin out. For a while, the remaining limpids will tend to prevent barnacle establishment while grazing but eventually, limpets will disaggregate, freeing barnacles to recruit onto empty patches of bare rock. Free from limpet grazing, barnacles will settle on open rock surfaces, creating complexities which facilitate the settlement of rack germlings, eventually leading to re-establishment of clumps of racks, thus beginning the cycle anew. The wide variety of marine life is fascinating to discover and may inspire your artistic or culinary instincts. This is the common starfish, or sea star, an important predator on the rocky shores from Arctic Norway to the coast of West Africa. Here is the edible or brown crab known locally as a pardon. One of its front claws is missing, but they have the ability to regenerate lost claws and limbs following future molting, especially when young like this one. Berthella plumula, the yellow plumed sea slug. 
on the lookout for colonial sea squirts, its gill visible under its right side. Soft and vulnerable to other marine predators, sea slugs typically protect themselves by secreting noxious chemicals. Brittle stars are lesser known cousins to the familiar starfish. They move more rapidly but have very delicate arms, so be very careful of handling. In deeper waters offshore, brittle stars may form dense beds, extending their arms to capture passing food. This segmented worm belongs to a diverse class of brittle worms known as polychaetes. Each segment contains a pair of appendages tipped with bundles of bristles that aid in locomotion. Rock pools can be great locations to find hermit crabs as they roam in search of food. One of the more curious phenomena you may occasionally find are these mysterious patterns. They appear to be ghost-like fossils of some branch plant. But how did they get here, and what left these remains? Washed up in a nearby rock pool is the answer. Neither ancient nor permanent, these strange patterns are the result of a subtidal seaweed called Desmorestia that has been washed up onto the rocks. All of the seaweed surrounding our seas are edible, except Desmorestia. The cells contain sulfuric acid. Once torn from their holdfast and left to dry on the rock, the acid leaches from the seaweed, killing a thin layer of microscopic algae that normally covers these rocks. Once washed away again, the ghostly etching of Desmarestia remains like a photographic remnant. Two important things to keep in mind when foraging for seaweed to eat is to only collect seaweed that is still attached and only collect seaweed from clean waters away from freshwater runoffs which may potentially contain pollution or bacteria. If you are collecting seaweed to identify, try to take a small sample of the whole plant, including the holdfast, where it attaches to the substrate. Examining the holdfast is necessary to distinguish between certain species. Here is Chondrus crispus, better known as Carrigian or Irish moss. When foraging to eat, please do so sustainably. It is best to harvest by cutting the ends off, leaving the holdfast intact. Our rocky shores are places of endless fascination and beauty. They provide a window into a world hidden beneath the waves and help us to understand the marine environment more intimately. With greater awareness and respect, we can all play our part in enjoying and caring for our natural habitats. I am an artist, inspired by working on the shore. I have been experimenting with found pigments that I then sketch with and collect ideas about this landscape that then find their way into paintings. More recently, 
I've been making brushes and using homemade charcoal sticks, inspired by Nick Nedo's book, The Organic Artist. Foraging for pigments is easy on the Orkney shore because of the old red sandstone of the Devonian period, which was laid down in the old, long disappeared freshwater lake, Lake Orcady. This soft sandstone renders a variety of colours from yellow ochre through burnt orange to dark brown. If you are lucky, you can also find hematite, which gives a wonderful dark red colour. You can use the pigments dry on dry paper, as you would with pastels. You can also use the pigments dry on wet paper using seawater, of course. You can make a paint from your pigment by wetting the stone with seawater and then grinding the pigment into it, or by putting the dry pigment dust into a handy limpet shell and adding seawater. Use your brushes or fingers to apply it to the paper, as with any new materials and tools. Spend some time in your sketchbook, testing out the mark-making potential of your new tools with your paints. I like to use mark-making materials that I have found to increase the range of marks I can make in creating my sketches, like pieces of shell, feathers, rock or driftwood, along with charcoal sticks from the fire. You can make a simple brush like this using materials you find along the shore and this simple knotless lash technique. These are the roots from the sorrel plant after they've been boiled in an old aluminium pan and then left to steep. Overnight is good and then you can boil it all again to get a deeper colour. Here you can see we've got a kind of mid-brown but the Shetland dye book suggests that you can obtain red from sorrel roots so I'm going to keep working on that. We've had some success with the pink stems, which are yielding colour, just with a gentle boil. And I particularly like the leaves, which are starting to give a lovely blue-green. That's helped by the iron that the cauldron is made from. Remember the chondrus crispus seaweed that Andrew gathered? Well this is the gel, achieved by giving it a fast boil. I reckon you can probably get gel from other seaweeds too, but this is one that's been used especially because of its gelling properties. You can mix it with pigments, mix it with your inks too to make them a bit thicker. Now you are ready to create your own sketch. The joy of having created your own materials in your chosen place is that you now know what you would like to focus on in your drawing. I'm going to focus on my favourite view of Hoy. There is something lovely about rooting the work in place by taking time to use what is found there to create the work.
Time to cook the tortillas now, the hard work's done. That isn't the last of sorrel's uses. It's been used in cheese making as a good curdling agent and as a cleaner too. I'll be running a workshop on how to make simple cheese with sorrel in this way soon. But until then, we're just going to sit back and enjoy some of the riches of the shore. And of course, that wonderful view.